So uh, thank you uh, to the organisers uh, for having me. Uh, so this is joint work with Robin Burgess at the London School of Economics and, and Michael Greenstone at, at Chicago. Uh, so I sort of have to make an initial apology as well. Uh, so Abhijit sort of talked about his paper not being uh, particularly development. Uh, I would say that this is, doesn't even have the benefit of being in a developing country, but it's global. Um, so it's more global economics than development economics. Um, but it's, it's more, uh, I guess, traditionally a, a, an environmental paper than a development paper per se. Um, and it sort of fits into a sort of a research agenda that we've been working on, uh, basically broadly thinking about how it is that we can manage uh, the world's sort of natural assets and liabilities uh, in such a way that sort of maximizes uh, global economic potential. And so we're going to sort of explore this question within the context of uh, the world's oceans, uh, which is an area which has uh, received very little sort of attention in, in economics, um, and for no small reason because of a lack of data. Uh, and that's sort of one of the main contributions we're going to sort of bring to the, the table today. Uh, and indeed, we, we sort of think that the economics uh, uh, of the oceans is important because, uh, well, for no other reason, they cover you know, a, a large majority of the world. Um, and they provide a, a, a just an immense amount of, uh, of economic value through the provision of ecosystem services uh, and climate management, uh, as well as obviously the sort of biodiversity and protein uh, that is uh, through uh, fisheries. Um, so they provide a lot of economic value, but at the same time, of course, they are, they are very much uh, threatened by economic behavior as well. And uh, if you can see here, this is a, uh, an image of uh, trawling uh, fishing trawlers from space, uh, and you can see the tracks of fishing trawlers uh, through uh, satellite images. And so uh, this sort of captures, uh, so trawling is, is one of the, seen as the one of the most destructive forms of fishing, but you can see it even uh, in the naked eye from, uh, from space. And so uh, these sort of capture the, the mud plumes that come out from sort of uh, basically tearing apart the, the seabed, uh, as well as sort of the, the scars that are left behind. Uh, and so um, the reason that, that we sort of think that the, the oceans are, are la largely threatened, the, the market failures that are important here are, are sort of twofold. So there's the sort of tragedy of the commons kind of argument whereby the sort of the goods in, uh, and services that the ocean provides are, are of course, uh, non-excludable. Oh, they're excluded. Ah, sorry. They're rival but non-excludable. Uh, and so uh, any given fisherman has no incentive to leave anything left behind in a given season because... Uh, someone else is just going to take it. And then, of course, there are uh, the considerations that uh, there are ecosystem services and, and sort of biodiversity considerations are not represented in, in, in fish prices. Uh, and so uh, there are sort of externalities that fishermen impose on the, on the natural environment which aren't, aren't internalized by their, by their behavior. And so conventional wisdom sort of, we believe, sort of suggests that the uh, allocation uh, and implementation of property rights uh, should go some of the way to addressing these concerns. And we're going to explore uh, the degree to which property rights can, can do this uh, through an examination of uh, marine protect protected areas. Uh, so these are conservation zones similar to sort of parks on land, but obviously uh, at sea. And so there's been plenty of talk about uh, marine conservation. Um, so the, the global goal currently uh, is to protect 10% of coastal and marine areas by 2020, uh, with aspirations of 30% coverage uh, by 2030. And it's incredibly costly to do this. Uh, the estimated cost uh, of which we should imagine wide confidence intervals is around about $37 billion per year. Uh, and so there's a, a question about whether this is, is sort of the best way uh, to sort of conserve uh, the marine environment to, in order to serve uh, sort of global economic uh, potential. So there's also been a lot of action. Uh, what's that cost? I mean, part of it is patrol and security. Part of it is was it lost profits. Is that <coughs> uh, so the num that's where the, the sort of confidence intervals come in. I mean, so uh, a large part of this, I think, is in terms of monitoring and enforcement. With any kind of exercise that, that these authors sort of engage in, as, as well as more broadly when we're trying to sort of think about the cost of conservation areas, there are the direct costs and then there are the indirect costs. And the, the indirect costs are just, you know, a lot more difficult to get a, 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 a number pinned down on, whereas the, the direct costs are more plausible. But I, there's still a lot of uncertainty in that. So there's been plenty of talk. There's been plenty of action. So uh, since 1994, when the UN Convention of the Seas sort of expanded 
uh, territorial waters to 200 nautical miles through the implementation of exclusive economic zones, this was a point when governments had some more capabilities for protecting uh, oceans. Uh, and since that time, we've seen uh, that the share of the ocean protected has sort of skyrocketed since the 1990s. I mean, I say skyrocketed, it's still only 4%, um, but it's, uh, it, the aspirations are, are to obviously increase that uh, more rapidly in the next sort of decades. Um, however, there's very little evidence on the uh, effectiveness of marine conservation zones uh, and, and what they actually do. And uh, dating back to, so there's a, a, a comment we found in, in the American Economic Review Papers and Proceedings back in 1979 by Maurice Wilkinson, who argued that there was a large shortage of this empirical evidence, not, uh, and, and largely back in that time because of a lack of biological knowledge, but also because just data availability is, is just a first order issue in this context. Uh, and so since this time, biological knowledge has, has, has substantially improved and we have a lot better understanding about the potential impacts on, on the environment as well as uh, uh, sort of the mechanisms underlying that. Um, but data quality has, has lagged behind. So the literature in this, in this space has been largely uh, theoretical or model based. Uh, and so this is where we're going to uh, hopefully sort of make some steps forwards. And so the, the paper we want to uh, sort of what well, the paper we're trying to write, at least, is, is, to, is to answer the question whether marine protected areas are effective as a conservation tool. And the way that we do this uh, is to use a boundary level uh, sort of spatial regression discontinuity design for approximately, seven, uh, approximately 600 marine protected areas around the globe, which were implemented between 1900 and 2000, uh, 2013. Uh, and we're able to do this uh, due to new data uh, from remote sensing products uh, on fishing activity and primary production, which you can think of as um, the sort of base trophic level in an ecosystem, which is sort of responsible for pretty much all life on Earth. Uh, so it's sort of photosynthesis and the energy that builds up and goes through to uh, uh, sort of... Sorry, can you repeat that? So what is primary production? Primary production is uh, the process of, trans trans uh, of converting inorganic carbon matter to energy-rich organic carbon products. So it's... Uh, if you think of trophic pyramids from like sort of high school, it's sort of grass on land and it's phytoplankton uh, at sea. And so it's sort of the core energy um, that comes from the sun. So uh, this is going to be sort of what we're going to argue is a, is a very much a black box measure of, uh, of ecosystem response. Uh, what we find is that on average, MPAs seem to be uh, reasonably effective uh, at uh, protecting local habitats and ecosystems. Uh, we see that they reduce fishing effort uh, and increase MPP um, by mm, moderate effects. Uh, we can get bigger numbers, though. Um, so this is the average effect. We do see that there are larger effects, uh, substantially larger effects, uh, estimated for MPAs that are uh, easier to enforce, so to speak. So these are going to be very broad measures. We're thinking about whether they're coastal and based on size of the MPA. So large MPAs are more difficult, we think, to enforce, and we find much smaller effects for them, whereas smaller and coastal MPAs, we find uh, much larger effects. But these are you know, correlates as opposed to um, having a good understanding of what's actually uh, driving these things. Yes? Can you give us a sense of what we should think of as the ideal target? Right? I don't know whether these are big or small numbers, because I have no idea what we're sort of aiming for. Um, so it's a very difficult question. I think so our, our, initial, um, our initial question was just to see, do we see any response? And like, uh, I think. My prior was, was on the less, less likely to find anything kind of side of things. Uh, but these are, I mean, there are a huge amount of zeros in the data, which is what drives down um, these things. A lot of the uh, debates on sort of footprint of fishing uh, in the oceans, which comes from the, the data that we're, we're now sort of able to use, uh, is the fact that you, know, you, can, you can sort of measure it in, based on different safe spatial scales. But like a large part of the ocean isn't actually directly fished, although it has a broader, broader impact. And so um, when we sort of inversely weight by sort of the, the cell, number of cells in an MPA, we get effects which are around about sort of 25% reductions in fishing effort. But to the degree that these MPAs are, are, should be stopping all fishing, um, then these are, these are small numbers. But it's, there's heterogeneity in the level of protection across these areas. So. So I know very little about fishing, but suppose I'm a fisherman and I'm outside of MPA, but there's an MPA nearby, and I decide I want to fish right up close to the border because the fish don't know there's an MPA. Yeah. 
That, is that a threat to your identification strategy? It would be, uh, a, it would be a spillover threat to our identification strategy. Um, and it's something we're going to explore um, throughout the paper. There's going to be a next slide, which is going to sort of internalize these discussions. But yes, spillovers is, is going to be uh, a, a constant threat in any kind of uh, analysis of, of sort of economic and environmental interactions. But spillovers here, uh, for, for several reasons, could be important. Um, so jumping off that. Uh, Maybe you're going to do this too, but uh, you can push this off. But I, I guess I'm trying to understand how, how these are drawn. Because like in some ways, I should draw them. I, if when I create them, I should create them such that the, the boundary, that's nobody's fishing there anymore. Where, like I don't need to make it larger because that's not an issue. And so it's like about late. You know, the, the boundary seems like you should optimally choose it such that you expect the RDB effect to be zero, or you know, it's really asking to zero there. Yes, so, so um, I'll, I'll get to that. That's certainly, uh, again, that could be considered as a as sort of the, endogenous, the endogeneity of the boundary. Um, generally, we think, so, so we're going to argue and uh, go under the argument that there are no straight lines in nature. That's sort of the, the sort of the principal argument for the, the plausible exogeneity of the boundary. And secondly, sort of having discussed this with policymakers and others, uh, it seems to be the case that sort of the decision is more based around sort of the, the size of the MPA rather than the exact location of the boundary. Sometimes the boundary is restricted if it's sort of coastal and, and obviously runs into land. Yeah. It's but it's, about, it's not about bias. It's just about the, the local average treatment effect of a boundary. Yeah. If you sort of say, like, I'm going to make this, here's the, the sweet spot for fishing. Let me make it this big. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to stop the size at a point where I don't think the ecological yeah, okay. concern is big. Yeah. And so whereas in the middle of it, you might have had a much bigger impact. So that's, again, I think a question then about whether we think people are optimally designing these, yeah. these things. And uh, I think that that is not necessarily the case. We see now that there are MPAs which are three times the size of Texas. Uh, and we see MPAs which are one square kilometer. Uh, and so there's going to be a Goldilocks size. But the majority of MPAs are incredi incredibly tiny and, and, and are argued by people in marine science and others to be like, these are doing nothing. What is the point of them? Yeah. Just following up on Seema's question, <coughs> do you have access to any sort of pre, pre and post data, do a double difference kind of thing? So we you do. can see what's happening inside? We're going to see that, yeah. Okay. yeah. <coughs> so we're going to, for, 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 the, for the subset of the MPAs where we have pre and post data, we're going to do sort of a diff and diff RD. Um, so we're going to do the RD pre and post. Think, no, say just plain diff and diff without the RD would be interesting. We can do that as oh, well, okay. of course, yeah. yeah. We can, but we're, we're more concerned about, yeah. Do you find bigger effects in the middle? <coughs> So we, we so I'll I'll get to this. Let me uh, move ahead and, and we can sort of get to the uh, what we actually do in the research design uh, shortly. So um, this is sort of the local effect. I think you know basically as uh, says this is going to be a local average treatment effect. But the, the sort of concern we have, the first sort of concern is is is, is going to be spillovers and, and general equilibrium effects. Like what are regulated agents going to do once they're affected by by these areas? You know so. Um, what we, the sort of second step, which is, is, is sort of taking a step back in terms of the internal validity of the identification strategy to try and get a more uh, externally valid kind of understanding of the, the overall effects of these things, is to try and internalize the potential for these spillovers to see uh, the degree to which um, MPAs actually affect sort of uh, more aggregate fishing behavior. And so we engage in a more continuous difference in difference and event study style approach uh, to sort of explore uh, the effects of increases in MPA coverage uh, within exclusive economic zones, which is sort of the, you can think of as this, uh, this is effectively the oceanic equivalent of a cross-country study. Um, so we have species-specific catch uh, and ex-vessel price data from administrative records for 66 EEZs between 1990 and 2009. And so using that sort of rollout diff and diff, uh, we find uh, that on average a one standard deviation increase in MPA coverage is associated with a 2.2% reduction in catch. There's an aggregate reduction uh, and a 1.2% increase in price. So demand slopes downward. Um, but what's interesting is the dynamics here. And we, we find that both the harvest and the price effects appear to sort of return to trend uh, within 10 years, which is consistent with, with ecological spillovers, which is one of the main uh, reasons you might be concerned that people maybe sort of after being kicked out of an area sort of hang around the boundary to sort of try and maximize. And that's actually seen as one of the benefits of, of marine protected areas as well. 
Um, the private economic benefits only sort of exist, as we'll see, when these spillovers exist. Um, but of course, we can't rule out adjustment costs or other kind of stories that could be consistent with this return to trend as well. So um, just to give a bit of a roadmap, I'm sort of just going to give a, there's a lot here, <laughs> uh, a brief overview of what MPAs are, um, present a simple model as to what we'd expect to sort of just tie the local uh, sort of uh, RDD analysis and the aggregate analysis together, and then sort of discuss uh, each of the empirical approaches in, in turn. So uh, MPAs are a sort of very uh, broadly defined uh, sort of category. The IUCN, uh, which is the International Union on, on, on Conservation, uh, define MPAs as places which have been recognized uh, as important for conservation because of their value to marine ecosystems. Um, this can include sort of historic and cultural values. So shipwrecks can be seen as, as very important and you don't want people to sort of go there, but also in terms of ecosystem uh, benefits and, and, and habitats, as well as uh, potentially um, benefits associated with sustainable production. So they could be implemented ex explicitly for the reason of trying to manage fisheries uh, more effectively. Uh, they're argued to be one of the most effect effective ways to recover and restore ocean life. And the argument goes under the assumption, let's assume that they're enforced, therefore they're good. And that's about the, the sort of the level of evidence base that we, we have uh, so far, uh, which we would sort of think of as credible. Um, but there are obviously major concerns about monitoring and enforcement, what are known as sort of paper parks, where these are legislated but not actually actively monitored and enforced, or, or really covering an area which is actually doing anything. You could think of it as, as greenwashing, so to speak. Um, and then, of course, there are the costs to fishermen as well. Uh, they're argued to be highly effective uh, because of the dispersal of biomass from protected areas to unprotected areas. So protecting birthing areas and, and sort of nesting sites is, a, is, is seen as a good thing because then the fish grow to be bigger and then they swim out and then they get caught and that's better than catching lots of baby fish which then has sort of knock-on effects in terms of population dynamics. But uh, of course, the benefits to fishermen from MPAs really does rely on the degree to which there are these ecological spillovers. Um, so they were first conceptualized uh, sort of from a policy perspective uh, more broadly uh, following World War II uh, where it was discovered that after uh, minefields were implemented in the North Sea, um, there were substantial increases in fish stocks, uh, which you can think of as a rather extreme uh, fisheries management policy. Uh, although, you know, Indonesia uh, have been sort of blowing up Chinese fishing vessels recently. Uh, and you'll see uh, a picture of fishing effort globally uh, shortly where French Polynesia is, is basically completely uh, sort of blank of fishing effort. Uh, largely due to the fact that its exclusive economic zones is, is very much covered by the French Navy, uh, which is obviously a very uh, big uh, sort of disincentive to try and sneak in and do some fishing. Um, and so prior to 1994, though, nations only had governance of their, of their seas up to three miles away. And so there's very limited options for exclusive economic zones to be implemented, certainly not at the scale which uh, we're seeing nowadays. The trend is for much bigger and bigger and bigger exclusive economic zones in order to sort of get to this 30% number, uh, which is not an objective. It, it is an objective uh, by the international community, but it's not clear from an economic perspective that it should be a, an objective in its own right. Um, in 1994, however, the establishment of the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zones meant that there were much greater property rights that governments had to sort of implement cons conservation areas. And so, as I mentioned, so the more modern um, marine protected areas have a sort of range of goals and a range of protection areas. They range from sort of no access zones where no one, no humans are allowed to go in, no take zones where, you know, you're not allowed to extract anything, um, or more zoned areas where, you know, or even just multiple use areas where fishing is allowed, but there may be fishing restrictions in place such as no trawling uh, and things like that. And they may be uh, sort of ob the objective maybe from, from a natural heritage perspective, such as the protection of coral or, or sea mounts, um, or for cultural reasons, uh, or up to the sort of more uh, fisheries management perspective of sustainable production. And I think this last point is an interesting sort of side question on whether MPAs are the most effective policy for thinking about uh, sustainable fisheries management, as opposed to, say, alternative uh, policy levers, which in the context of market design and, and mechanism design is sort of an interesting discussion to have potentially. Um, so, so just quickly from outside the NPA, there'll be massive headache in terms of the regulation of fishing. 
from quite extensive to completely. So outside of the, the MPA, um, so for example, Chile, has, as of this year, has banned trawling in 98% of its exclusive economic zone. Um, so that's not a marine protected area, it's a gear restriction. Um, but yeah, there's, there's going to be potentially crossovers in terms of quotas, schemes, and, uh, and other po marine policies that could be in, in effect. So yes, um, we have very limited granular data on, on what policies are in effect. Um, subsidies are a huge thing as well. Okay, so just to clarify, not NPA here is going to be a mixture of all these different other regimes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, to sort of try and discipline our, our thinking on this, we, we, we wanted to write down a, a, a sort of a model to, to sort of try and think about the interaction between the sort of the biology side of things and the economic side of things. And uh, so uh, to sort of capture the, the, the biological elements of things, we wanted to start from this sort of very general perspective of there being a resource stock, uh, X. And this model can be generalized to think about uh, land versus or, or sea. So you could apply this to sort of forestry or other ecosystems. Uh, and this is distributed across sort of a, a, just a spatial domain of, of N uh, non overlapping patches, that should say, not overlapping patches, so these discrete patches of land. And so the, the resource is a, is a renewable resource, it's going to grow, uh, and it has the option of dispersing uh, across these patches as well. So trees don't move, so there's no dispersal of trees, but fish swim. And so uh, you can imagine that uh, for a given patch, that, that patch is going to sort of grow up and then so some of those fish are going to leave that patch and migrate to other patches and so we wanted to capture this dispersion uh, consideration here um, and so the, the timing in the in the model is going to be captured by the fact that the, the present stock is going to be observed and then fishermen are going to sort of harvest it um, and then this is going to give us this residual stock which is uh, is going to simplify the the model um, substantially uh, which is then going to grow up so to speak whatever's left in the in the sea is going to continue to grow based on uh, how much is left as well as sort of carrying capacity or any other way you want to sort of think about parameterizing alpha um, and then once it's grown up it's going to then then disperse so that's a very simple sort of in general framing of uh, of sort of the, the the biological sort of setting and then the fishing behavior side of things is, is very much dates back to sort of early work by uh, which was published in the JP by by Gordon uh, and Vernon Smith um, whereby you know, in, a, in a given period uh, Fishermen are going to sort of harvest from this initial population, um, and they're going to get uh, sort of an, we're going to assume an elastic price, um, and they're going to be subject to these sort of uh, costs which are, are stock dependent. And so the premise here is that you can imagine if you have like a fish tank and you you sort of move the the fish net through the fish tank, when the stock is bigger, you're going to catch more fish, and so costs are going to be lower. But as the stock uh, diminishes, you have to sort of put your net through the the fish tank more and more in order to get. Uh, the same amount of fish, or if there are that many fish uh, left behind. And so uh, in sort of equilibrium, uh, people are going to sort of move to the patches with the highest marginal profit, and they're going to fish until price is equal to marginal cost, or until uh, there is no fish left. So if you have linear, linear costs, then you know, they're basically going to fish that, that, that patch until extinction. And so what we wanted to think about was, OK, well, what happens if we, we close one of these patches off? Um, so if we assume that the closed patch was profitable prior to implementing the MPA, then if we close a patch, then this weekly increases the resource stock in all patches if there's dispersal, and it will strictly increase the resource stock in at least one patch. So we're, we're basically imposing that there's no harvesting, and so the uh, residual stock is just going to grow up until ca carrying capacity at that sort of XIT uh, consideration. Um, and so. If there are these resource spillovers, then you can imagine a case which in sort of a, as a corollary is going to be the case that e even with linear costs, if they're, if they're extracting fish to extinction in, in fringe patches, uh, you can still have this continual uh, sort of supply of fish through migration out of the, the protected patch to the fringe patches. Um, and so from a, from a biology perspective, you sort of have this unambiguous increase uh, in, in, in biomass under the assumption of enforcement. There's no sort of enforcement. It's a very simple model here. Uh, in terms of sort of profits, the effect on aggregate profits really depends on the, the degree to which there are ecological spillovers. Yeah. Sorry, just a quick question about the process. Do fish, I don't know anything about how fish stocks work, but I thought there were like sort of like collapses or like sort of catastrophic uh, sort of overfishing situations. So we could have that. We, we don't rule out the possibility of extinction. That would be where EIT turns to zero. Um, 
when there are, I I in the event that we sort of closed off a patch which was profitable prior to, uh, to fishing, so if there was still some stock left behind, that stock's going to recover. And if that then disperses to the fringe patches, you could have those, the stocks in the fringe patches completely obliterated. Right, they could be yeah, yeah. zero residual you, stock you, there. You something for that in, for instance, that the patch that you closed was one that was profitable to start with. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. sorry I'm just being slow. No worries. Great. Did it. So the DIJs you assume were sort of exo fixed, but now you can imagine situations where the population goes up, there's more competition for prey, and so then they start migrating more. Yeah, so, yeah, so there's, so no, there's no reason. Is there reason psychological more. evidence on this matter? Oh, so. <laughs> I'm sure there is. <laughs> uh, I'm not the person that I don't have a good answer to that question. There's nothing that could stop you from endogenizing these these parameters in terms of the biological. How does that affect your uh, what you're going to do? So I, I think it shouldn't it shouldn't affect. So I mean I think the most the, the sort of the limiting cases are going to be where where D is just not happening, right? In which case the the biomass is only going up in the in the the stock itself. When you sort of allow for there to be some dispersal, there are there are. Ex there are very sort of there's a bunch of different cases you could imagine you could imagine it depends on relative carrot like relative capacity so if you have sort of lower stocks in one area you have stock flowing in if it's higher then it flows out you could have sort of sink and source kind of mechanics it's it shouldn't matter for uh, it, they're all sort of limiting cases or, or special cases rather of, of, of the results that we're going to present and so I don't, we don't need to model it explicitly to get the sort of general results which I'm going to present here. So in that respect, uh, there's more we could do with the model. But in terms of mapping it to what we're going to be able to do empirically, um, we're not going to push it very far. There's a huge modeling literature which, which goes into very um, specific cases uh, in this case. We're trying to sort of go for the, the, the broadest uh, brush here um, to get the, the inferences we we're looking for. Yeah. This might be irrelevant. So you mean so there could be? Like a, you know, like there's like a model of, of automatons where they would uh, be inflow into the affected area. Yeah. yeah. So you could, yeah, no, so exactly. So in terms of relative densities, you could imagine the case that if they protect a, 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 an area. Density, I guess I mean even just this like risk factor of being uh, trolled or whatever. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, so, so I think that these are all empirical questions, right, as to whether these spillovers exist and what direction they go. Um, when we look at the sort of the effects on, on fishermen, um, there's only going to be direct benefits to the fishermen if there are outflows from the MPA to, to unprotected areas. Um, if there are, it comes to like a design perspective in terms of if you want to think about the best way to design these areas, designing an MPA which is going to have, is going to be absorbing fish rather than sort of spreading it out is maybe not the best thing you want to do from the fisherman's perspective. Um, similarly, protecting an area which doesn't have very high you know, ecosystem value is, is obviously not going to be a, a great choice either as well. And so I think what we want to do is sort of characterize the potential for these spillovers uh, and then try and understand empirically the degree to which they, they actually exist given the current patchwork of, of protected areas that we have. So in terms of profits, um, the aggregate effect is going to depend on the degree to which uh, these spillovers exist. So uh, in the open access fringe, we can imagine sort of three types of, of fishermen. So there are, there are people in the open access uh, fringe where, where the stock is not spatially connected in any way to the enclosed patch, and they're going to be unaffected by, by the enclosure. So they're sort of spatially disconnected. Um, so nothing really changes for them when the MPA comes into, into effect. Um, we can imagine that there are users in the open access fringe who are connected to the, to the patch, and they'll see an increase in, in stocks as long as there are these, these, these spillovers. So we need there to be these, if, if D is zero, then they get, so there's no real willingness to pay for them to have this MPA. They don't benefit from, from these, these sort of spillover stocks. Um, the effect on the people who were excluded from the patch, of course, is going to be the, depending on the degree to which these spillovers are able to offset those, potch, those patches because the spillovers can reduce costs, of course. So it, isn't, there is, it is possible for profits on aggregate to increase as a result of the, of the, of the spillovers if they exist. Um, if there are no spillovers, then, then there, is the, there are no private benefits to the, 
um, to the fisherman. Um, of course, there are broader benefits than, than private benefits. If we care only about natural heritage and, and from, a, from sort of ecosystem services perspective, then we may wish to restrict fishing for, for reasons beyond sort of sustainable uh, production. You may want to, uh, you may not care about the fish per se, but you care about the fact that trawling is going to destroy your coral uh, or your sea sponges or, or sort of other considerations or seagrasses, which we think are important for, for carbon sequestration and everything. And so you may choose to sort of protect these areas anyway. And so from a sort of cost benefit perspective, you, you may uh, sort of still uh, think that it's worthwhile having these being protected areas if the, if the sort of social benefits in terms of uh, the externalities associated with marine protected areas exceed the, the foregone profits uh, to the fishermen. Um, of course, valuing these externalities is not easy. And we're going to have very little to say about them today beyond the fact that we, we can sort of demonstrate that there is an ecological response. Um, whether we think that there is value on putting numbers on these things at all, I think the answer is certainly yes. It's better to have some number than no number. But of course, any number that's going to be used, we think ought to be generated as, as, as sort of thoughtfully as, as possible. Um, so that's sort of my side on non-market sort of valuation. Um, so I think just to sort of summarize this uh, in terms of sort of the take home from the model, and as I say, it's, it's very, very simple and, and sort of embarrassingly so for a, an audience which is a lot more mathematically savvy than I am. Um, sort of the key take home from the model for us is the fact that the, from the fisheries perspective, the key is these spillovers. Do they exist or not? Right? There, there are social benefits from, from protecting an area, but in terms of we're going to be looking at fishing activity as a, as a measure of the degree to which these things are enforced or not. Uh, that's going to be sort of the, 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 the key interesting dynamic in, in the model is going to be the degree to which there are these spillovers. Yeah. Tell me if this is, is wrong. Um, you'll, you'll have higher density of fish in the marine, marine protected area than in the neighboring areas. Yeah. So if you just thought about the ocean as a whole, it would be, it would be efficient to move some, and without thinking about any of the, the responding areas or any, any, any detail like that, it'd be efficient to do, the, do more fishing do the same amount of fishing as gets done, but move some of that fishing into the marine protected areas and cut some of the fishing in the other areas. It could be, yes. Yeah, so, but, so that would suggest these are not a great, you know, well designed from a global perspective, but are the costs of enforcement of a marine protected area much lower than trying to just say tax fish takes or something like that? Because you just, you know, if you see any fishing boat in that area, you know that they're, they're not supposed to be there or? Mm -hmm. so or is it, you know, you would, and I guess I would have thought that the fact that you generate positive externalities is a downside, not a plus side. I mean, there's an argument that's a downside, not a plus side, because then individual countries will have insufficient incentives to do that because they don't, they don't fully capture the benefits from it. Um, and, you know, you might want to design international institutions in some other way that would create more incentives for individual countries to, you know, for, for, for this to happen. Oh yeah. Okay. So whether countries have an incentive to protect sort of the social benefits of, of marine protection is is like obviously you know a major issue in discussion. Um, from a purely a fisheries management perspective, there is this question of would it be better to sort of allocate individual property rights to a fish in these areas, and and that's basically what an in, 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 uh, what a, a transferable quota is. You you give a fishing boat sort of you can catch this much fish. And then people can trade, and that sort of is a way of managing fish stocks, maybe in a more efficient way than a just a you can't fish here. But of course, if you care about sort of coral reefs and, and other things, then the right. allowing people to fish through quota systems isn't going to protect sort of those critical habitats. And so, from a critical habitat perspective, which obviously there are tourism benefits as well. So it's not just uh, you know if you think about the Great Barrier Reef, like you don't want people trawling through the Great Barrier Reef right. because not just because of the ecosystem services, but right. Uh, because of the market benefits as well. Um, so yeah, from a fish, there is a question about from just a purely fisheries management perspective, these are an effective or a good use of, of, of funds. There are potentially much more efficient policies that could be used. But from a conservation perspective, which is, is sort of the broader focus of the paper, um, we want to understand whether they, they do anything at all. If, if, if the objective is, I want to protect this coral reef, and then they don't do anything, <laughs> well, then we want to know that. And that's, you know, we're at a stage at the moment where we don't have a good evidence base on that. 
So, um, so John, uh, ten okay, yeah, thank you. So um, from a research design perspective, you know, the problem we, we sort of face is that MPAs are endogenously placed. We don't think that the areas that are chosen to be protected are, uh, you know, or the areas that aren't chosen to be protected rather are particularly good counterfactual for the areas that are chosen for obvious reasons. Um, and so one uh, approach that we take to try and get at this is to think about uh, uh, using the fact that the boundaries of MPAs are, are plausibly exogenous. Um, decision makers tend to decide on the size and the location, but the exact placement of boundaries are, are going to be plausibly exogenous. Um, and so we're going to rely on this argument that there are no straight lines in nature as well. So, um, and, and we're going to sort of push strongly on this if there's no other reason that because of a lack of data, there's limitations in what we can do about continuity assumption. Right? We can, there's limited other data that we can do to test continuity assumption, which is why the pretreatment data is going to be our, our sort of linchpin, so to speak. Um, and so um, it would be nice to do randomized control trials of MPAs. Um, we would think about there are potential opportunities for doing it, but it's, uh, it's certainly not on, on the agenda uh, yet. Um, it, would, it would be logistically difficult, I think. Um, so I think this is probably about as close to the, uh, the gold standard we're able to get at the moment. Uh, it's clearly an improvement on sort of looking at just sort of inside versus outside. And of course, even with an RCT, we'd still have these issues of spillovers um, to sort of address. And so for a, a given boundary of a marine protected area, uh, we're just sort of going to engage in, in sort of a standard RD uh, setup. And I'm going to move quickly over this, we're going to aggregate over all of the boundaries for multiple years, uh, and so sort of look at discontinuities within a boundary year. So we're going to have fixed effects to sort of address that. Um, OK, I'm going to move on. So uh, just an illustration. So this is the Challenger North Benthic Protection Area in New Zealand. Uh, it's not a no-take zone, but there is no trawling allowed in this area. Uh, trawling makes up about 80% of the data uh, in terms of fishing effort and about 70% of catch. And so trawling is really the, the main sort of fishing effort that, that we should be thinking about when, when, when looking at these effects. Um, and so we're going to sort of be comparing cells just inside versus just outside across varying boundaries. So the outcome data we're going to look at is uh, fishing effort, which is total hours per year. And this is data provided by Global Fishing Watch, which is now publicly available. And it's produced by raw AIS data. So this is like uh, GPS for boats, effectively. Um, which provides us with the vessel position every five seconds um, for around about 70,000 fishing vessels for the whole world. Um, so it captures a very large stock of commercial fishing vessels. Uh, it's obviously going to miss the lower end of the distribution substantially. Um, but it's, uh, it's a pretty decent chunk of the sort of industrial fishing stock. Uh, so we have about 22 billion signals between 2012 and 2016. The sort of combined fishing registries to so sort of know whether the boats are fishing boats or not, uh, and then use machine learning techniques to try and sort of distinguish the other ones whether they might be fishing boats or not. And so the machine learning basically looks at vessel tracks to try and say whether fishing is happening versus when a boat is just moving to a, another location, say A to B. And so purse signs are what you see in Finding Nemo. Uh, so they sort of they go around the stock and then zip up the net. Uh, long line is sort of learn out like thousands of hooks and then run them back again and then trawlers are the ones that are sort of digging along the, along the seabed and trawling is is what makes up the majority of fishing in in sort of coastal and exclusive economic zones because in the in the deep seas of course you can't really uh, get down deep enough to to do the trawling um so line long line is a, a sort of the predominant uh fishing technique used in the high seas so this is what the annual fishing data uh looks like across the world so this is the uh, French Polynesian islands that I was mentioning earlier. Um, and then I wanted to sort of show you a video. So this is a, a, the PIPA marine protected area. And in 2015, it goes into effect. And so you sort of have uh, prior, to it, well, prior to the MPA going into effect, you have lots of fishing going on. And then this one works. So the point of this is to show that you can cherry pick one that works really well. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, uh, this is the. Uh, how can I pronounce this? Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument off the boundaries of Hawaii. Uh, and it went into effect in uh, July, August 2016. And you'll have noticed nothing, really. Uh, and in fact, fishing effort going on after it had gone into effect. And it's a no-take zone. So there's no fishing effort allowed going on. And it's the one that's three times the size of Texas. So in 2017, it was the largest marine protected area in the world. 
And so the point is that the evidence we have so far from sort of uh, other empirical studies where data has been a variable has been sort of local case studies uh, of individual sites, but we want a more sort of global perspective on whether these things work or not. And so we combine that data to sort of the second point on, on, on this one is to say, well, even if there's no reductions in fishing effort, there still may be benefits, of course, to protecting the area from an ecosystem services perspective. Um, so just because there's no fishing effort going on per se, uh, doesn't mean we wouldn't want to stop fishing effort going on in the future. So there could still be benefits from that area being protected. Um, yeah. Sorry, I might have missed this. Do you have the stocks per location? No, we have limited, like no one really knows what the stocks are. I'm going to say, how do I measure the stocks? We can't measure. We, we, we have very bad data on stocks. So um, we're just going to measure the presence. Yes, fishing, fishing effort. Okay. And then we're going to measure catch. We're going to know catch as well at a more aggregate level. But we're going to know whether fit people are fishing or not. And then we're going to have data on net primary production, which is going to be a sort of, is there an ecological response? And the point of this is to, number one, sort of ensure that what we're actually getting is a real reduction in fishing effort, as opposed to people just turning off their GPS. Um, as well as to sort of see whether the, the environment, the ecosystem actually responds to these marine protected areas. And that's by cell? Yes. Okay. So we, we, for MPP, we have about 4 million cells per year. Um, it's gonna be a, all of this is on like a 0.1 degree grid, basically. Um, the next best data is there are 80 in situ sites around the world for MPP, <laughs> um, of which we have a 20 year time series. So whether we have one in, M, in an MPA or not is like, very unlikely, and then do we have any on either side of the boundary? Definitely not. For stocks, there are about 300 stock assessments around the world. So the whole ocean divided into 300 areas. So this is satellite measured. Um, so we have uh, net primary production, which is based on ocean color measures, so photosynthesis, effectively. Um, and so MBP, it fuels all life on Earth, it regulates atmospheric carbon and ocean co oxygen concentrations, so it provides about two thirds of global oxygen, and around about uh, it absorbs in terms of deep carbon sinks around about fifty percent of the global carbon stock. Um, that is to say that carbon dioxide emissions would be about eight hundred parts per million rather than four hundred parts per million in the absence of this. Uh, and then, of course, it is what provides energy for fish. So more MPP, bottom up, more fish. Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to run. I'm going to stop questions now. I haven't managed this well. Um, so MPP, it's around about 50 petagrams of carbon per year. It's about equivalent to sort of what you get from, from uh, MPP on land as well. It's about 50%. Uh, it could affect, so MPAs could affect MPP in sort of two, in three ways, direct effects. So reducing turbulence, pollution, and damage to the sea surface, which would increase light. So more light equals more photosynthesis. Uh, reductions in extraction could reduce uh, could increase the availability of nutrients, so more nutrients, more MPP, and then there are indirects through food webs and other things which are more complex, and I'm going to hold that off for now. Um, the MPAs we have uh, are about 600 after we combine the gridded data with the MPAs, because there are lots of small ones, we don't have good inside and outside data, and we capture about 80% of all protected areas. This is what the full sample of MPAs have, this is what our analysis sample looks like, so blink and you'll miss it. Nothing really going on there, so that we're capturing a large share of the area. Um, this is what the RDs look like. So the, if we're going to do three minutes, then this is a good three minutes to do. So we do see these reductions in, in fishing effort at the boundary. Uh, in terms of the diff and diff, we see up until implementation, there's not really anything going on pre-treatment, and then large reductions in fishing effort. In terms of MPP, smaller, but positive uh, increases just inside the boundary, and again, a more gradual rollout over time after implementation, which is more consistent with the ecological response that we'd expect, so a gradual recovery. Um, so MPAs are effective, increasing biomass and reducing fishing effort, take my word for it. There's no discontinuity prior to implementation, it's robust to everything you'd want it to be robust to. Uh, coastal MPAs and smaller MPAs deliver more benefit consistent with enforceability. So in one minute, what are the aggregate effects? So we're gonna do a sort of diff and diff rollout, um, we use catch reconstruction data for exclusive economic zones. So this is based on uh, log books on what fish have been caught. Um, so we have species specific catches. It's not stocks, but it's, it's what's caught. So we don't know how much is left in the sea. Um, this is what coverage looks over time. And what we see is that uh, if there was 100% coverage, which is completely out of sample, you uh, get sort of increases in price and reduction in quantity. 
there are sort of the, the price effects mute the effects on revenues, uh, and there are no aggregate effects on MPP. These are the graphs that I think are the most interesting. So if we look at the rollout, you see sort of an increase in prices and then a return to trend. And this is really the golden goose if you want to interpret this as ecological spillovers because you see immediate reductions in volume and then a return to trend within sort of seven years. I mean, the data is noisy and that this is about as close to ecological spillovers as one can get. Of course, this could also reflect adjustment costs of fishing, fishing fishers find, having to find new areas and adjust to account for this sort of restrictions. Um, but that's kind of useful to think about in terms of like the effects on fishermen, because I think we care about the, the costs to these fishermen as well, the degree to which they're able to respond and recover to these new regulatory conditions. So um, what we see is that MPAs reduce aggregate extraction in the short run. Uh, the price effect attenuates the impact on revenues from a sort of cost perspective on fishermen. That's kind of, I think, a, a good thing. Um, and then the interesting is the fact that we found any dynamics given the, the coarseness of the data, but there does seem to be this sort of uh, return to trend. So to conclude, sorry, Ben, uh, are MPAs effective as a conservation tool? We think yes, on average, and certainly when they're designed to account for enforcement considerations, uh, then maybe even more so, they do appear to reduce fishing effort and sort of invoke an ecological response. Uh, and in terms of the aggregate effects as well, um, MPAs do appear to sort of reduce aggregate reduction extraction in the short run with a return to trend. And this could be ecological spillovers, it could be adjustment costs, and there's a question over whether understanding the mechanism is, is of first order importance because whether you care about it from a trans, uh, transitional cost to fishermen in terms of substitutability of areas or in terms of like they're getting this sort of bigger fish kind of approach, um, both are positive, I think. So enforcement matters in terms of reflections on the mine. Ecological spillovers are key for private economic benefits. Um, and then this more broader point, I think, which we still have a very uh, limited evidence on in terms of the social benefits of MPAs. So yeah, thank you, and sorry for going over. <laughs> right, uh, thanks for having me discuss this paper, and thanks uh, to Jonathan for writing the paper. I had a lot of fun uh, reading it, uh, so this is going to be hopefully a short discussion on how to focus the paper and how to help develop it, and I realize that I'm the only thing that stands between you and lunch, so I will tr aim to finish in 10 minutes. So let's start with a quick summary. Um, I think you, since we are both actually British, me and Jonathan, we can say that this is very much a paper of two halves. So the summary comes in two halves. The first half the f is the statement that MPAs actually work for biomass and effort reduction. So we've got some remote sensing data and regression the discontinuity showing that there is an efficacy of the MPAs. We have a reduction of fishing effort, which is measured by total hours, and we have an increase in biomass, which is measured by MPP. And it, we also find that effort reduction due to MPAs is very heterogeneous across regions. It depends on whether they're coastal or offshore, right? Coastal being more efficient, large versus small, small being again more efficient. And this focuses on the idea of enforceability, which Jonathan highlighted numerous times. So this is part one. And we also had this effect of spillovers, where the spillovers were crucial uh, in the latter part to show uh, that the EEZ level, that this, this was uh, giving private benefits. OK, so what's the second part of the paper? We have the economic implications of the MPAs. And here we saw that in the short run, the MPAs do correlate with a lower catch and higher fish prices on aggregate. But the change in fishing revenue is not significant in any of the regressions. And then we have this fantastic result that in 10 years' time, we have a recovery and everything returns to where it should be before because of uh, these spillovers. So there is an increase in biomass which spills over and generates the same overall long-term catch. Or at least that's how I read the paper. If I read it wrong, please correct me later. So again, spillovers are crucial for establishing the gains from the MPAs. So if this is roughly how, how the paper is, if I read it correctly, um, then we can also see that adding all of these things together, this is something that you, I think, quoted in one part of the paper, is that if we're looking at conservation of localized species, MPAs look like a good match for that policy objective. Right? So what are the contributions of the previous literature? I'm going to be very short on this because the contributions are very obvious. First of all, we have a nice new data set, which is much better than what we've had before. And the previous work was either too theoretical or too localized. So this is really a global analysis, 
which is a very big improvement. Also, the counterfactual comparisons were taken much more seriously. There wasn't time to go through them in the talk, but there's plenty of them in the paper, and I really enjoyed them. In particular, the attention to the boundaries uh, is, is well addressed. And also, it is a combined analysis of biological and economic models, which makes it into a very nice package. Okay, so what are the strengths of the paper, or what I like? This is going to be obviously biased. Um, I think the research design is neat, and there's a very clear relationship between the theory model and then what we expect to see from the data, and lo and behold, that's what we find. There are a lot of robustness checks, which is always very reassuring if you like playing with the data. And I think in, in this part of the debate as to what should we do with MPAs, we had this ambitious target of 30% coverage. Well, this is a very necessary paper because before we discuss whether we need 30% of these things, it's good to know that they actually work. Right? It's kind of fundamental. So also the identifying uh, assumptions I found quite intuitively plausible and the factors that vary across the boundary besides treatment look like the kind of things that should be continuous and they are verifiable and the verifications are carried out in the paper. So that made me very happy. Okay? So a few things to consider. The first thing uh, that slightly threw me was the title and the focus of the paper because when I read it, uh, the, the way you know, as an economist says, the economics of uh, marine conservation, I thought, okay, they're going to tell me what's the price of saving the whales or, you know, some other species, but that's not quite what I got. And I think, in a way, the title is both too narrow and too broad in the sense that actually there's more than just economics. There's a contribution on the effect on uh, biomass and other things which are not just economics, but just as important and that might restrict the target audience of the paper uh, unnecessarily because I think it is an important uh, contribution just beyond the economics and also actually the economics bit has the fewest and least significant findings uh, compared to a lot of the other stuff we've, we've got on the conservation part. So this is something we might maybe discuss in the last five minutes before lunch is to see how we can contribute to finding a way of pitching all of this together that would maximize the impact of this paper. One big elephant uh, in the sea, in this case, um, is the enforcement cost, which is not modeled, which should be quite important, especially since that is something that seems to drive whether an MPA works or not. Uh, we have the price and quantity used for welfare analysis, but doesn't, that doesn't seem to capture the whole story, right? And also, depending on the species, this is something you could probably check. The prices may or might not be very responsive to local catch, so they might be more influenced by global uh, prices than by local ones. But this is something that you should be able to check at a species level, right? And also, it might be worthwhile checking whether the MPA is targeting a particular species in a particular region and to see whether that correlates with this. It should do, and if it doesn't, it's a little bit strange. Um, broader welfare comparisons, and when I hear about the economics of something, I think about cost-benefit analysis, which given that this is a very first and fresh draft of the paper, maybe wasn't done yet, but maybe this is something that you could look at in the future. So obviously, MPAs are not the only method for reducing fishing effort, and for a comprehensive comparison, we need to look at what the alternatives are, whether they are viable or whether they're better. And I think this would make the paper more directly policy relevant. And having worked a little bit in fisheries, policy people like clear pointers and they like comparisons where you can show A is better than B. So I think if you could, even in very qualitative ways, do a cost-benefit analysis relative to quotas, which would probably be easier to enforce, or this archaic idea of direct effort regulation, where you just limit the number of fishing days, which we know comes with various problems like Olympic fishing and so forth. But it might be worth to show that, OK, we can make these comparisons. And I think that's something that you can do with the data that you have. OK, um, another thing to talk about is the data, whether it's representative and how relevant it is to this whole uh, global situation. So in the draft of the paper that I got, you start with about 7,200 MPAs. And the analysis is run on 655 of them, which is less than 10% by count. OK. But great, those six, 655, they account by more than 80%. So actually, we're covering a large part of, of the global MPAs. But of course, you're oversampling the large ones, right? So the puzzle, right, when if you want to increase 
the coverage of MPAs to 30%, the quickest way to do that is to have large offshore MPAs because that's where you've got lots of space and you can make them large. But those are not the ones that actually have the strongest effects, right? So the largest effort reduction, lowest cost, are small coastal MPAs. And those are probably the ones on which you don't have data. So you're really undersampling uh, from this group, which actually might have a big impact. And especially if you're planning on expanding MPAs in the future, trying to figure out which one of these two to target from a policy point of view might be something that's quite valuable. So the question is, how innocuous is it that you're undersampling 90% of the small MPAs? And maybe you can actually do a sensitivity analysis by subsampling from the 655 that you have and subsampling even less from the small ones that you have just to see at the margin whether there is any change to your estimates. I'm not sure whether this is a good or a bad idea, but we'll have a couple of minutes that someone can maybe uh, comment whether this might help or not. And I think I've got a couple more slides. Sorry? Two minute warning. Two minute warning. OK. Um, I like this paper, and I think it comes at a good time. But if this sort of analysis were to be conducted in the future, uh, there are some worries about that here, and also the idea of GPS tracking. So the timing of the sample is crucial. And there is this general equilibrium effect that if you start tracking things, people know you're watching them, they will change their behavior. In this case, in particular, they will start manipulating this AIS trackers and misreporting GPS data. So there are these two reports from a company called Winward. They did one in 2014 and another one last year. And they showed that in 2013 to 2014, there was an almost 60% year-on-year increase in manipulation and falsification of AIS data. Okay, and so this actually was already happening during the data window you had from 2012 to 2016. I think in the paper you said that because uh, it wasn't used for fishing tracking, you don't think it influences it. But from talking to fishermen, when they know that someone's watching for whatever reason, they get suspicious. Uh, and there was one case where I think someone reported a GPS tracking uh, path in the middle of the, on the route to China, but it actually outlined uh, the southern coast of South Africa. Uh, it was just a location shift because it was obviously uh, not in the right place. So, so to put some figures on this, um, from Windward, the persistently false IDs were reported on 1% of vessels. Is that a lot? Is that a little? Well, thinking about a JFK airport, that's about 1,500 people per day going through security unchecked. Does that scare you or not? Uh, we can ask the TSA. Manual switching off happens in about 10% of the vessels, which I think is quite a lot. And of course, the which vessels are cheating is unlikely to be random, right? So the ones which are cheating are most likely the ones that might be profitable. Uh, and there's an unintended consequence, which probably as economists we're not that worried about. But from a policy point of view, AIS was initially supposed to be for maritime safety to prevent ships from running into each other. If you start manipulating these things, it causes safety concerns. So just to wrap this up, and since I am supposed to sort of open up the discussion, here are a few questions uh, to do that. The first thing is, as you said, um, what is the position of economic argument in determining MPAs versus conservation and emotive reasons? Of course, we're all economists. We think it's really important. But it's important to remember there's also some other people coming from conservation, like Arpon and their research group, who basically say, OK, economics doesn't matter. Another thing is, OK, at which level should we evaluate the policies uh, from MPAs? So do we need to look at these general equilibrium effects, such as the response to increased GPS tracking and what impact that has on misreporting? So I think you found that the effort reduction went down by 5%. The NPP went up by 1%. Well, actually, if people are switching off the GPS trackers quite a lot, that would give you that sort of thing where the effort is going down by a lot but the response is less, well, part of that might be because they're telling you that they're reducing effort by more than they actually are. So I would take that seriously. And one thing which I think this paper could be used for, because you measure these heterogeneous effects, you can actually try to run a simulation to check where to put future MPAs in a most cost-effective way. And there are two nice papers, one by uh, Lethwick from New Zealand in 2008 and Armsworth from 2017 on US forests, where they do exactly that. 
they check where it is most efficient to put MPAs in terms of uh, overall cost minimization of a given uh, conservation effort. So that would be the things um, I think might be useful for the future of this paper. I enjoyed it a lot, and uh, thanks for having me. I don't know whether I'm over time or not. Time for a couple questions. Can I sort of just make okay. the oh, general, oh, sure. General I'll be fine when you get the time to. Yeah, okay. So um, just sort of relate to, to all these comments. I think they're, they're really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, so if it wasn't clear, I, I include the conservation benefits in economic benefits. Right? So I mean, I, 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 insofar as I think we think that there is economic value to conservation, right? I mean, we like oxygen. Oxygen is good. Uh, and carbon sequestration, there are clearly economic benefits uh, associated with that as well. So there are, I think, this distinction between economic versus conservation, where economic is only seen as like private benefits, is like I think not what we're trying to say. Um, but I think it's an important consideration. The the um, on the monitoring and the avoidance and the turning off of AIS and stuff. That's that's like a first order concern for us. Um, that's why part of the reason we look at the MPP data as well, right? So if all of this was just turning off the, the AIS tracking, then you shouldn't see any any sort of ecological response. So we think we're at least getting some of it. Of course, there could well be um, AIS tracking data turning off. What's really cool with the data is that, so we've been working with the grid grid level data previously, but but now it seems like we, in theory, at least we can get access to the, the vessel level data. And part of that, we can actually see when boats actually do turn off their tracking device. So we know where they turned it off, where they turned it on again, and how long it was off for. So like, the plan there is to maybe write like a monitoring and like a, a compliance paper where, unlike all other compliance papers where you don't see non-compliance, we actually get to see non-compliance. So we're, we're quite excited about um, opportunities. Um, but yeah, questions would be wonderful. Maybe time for one question. You're the only one. Um, so in a sense, we, we knew right away from the first video you showed that at least if we look at the effects, not at necessarily MPP or uh, the return of the fishing, fishing stocks, but just on fishing activity. Yeah. We knew that already from that, that if you have enough enforcement, you can get it down to zero entering that yeah. rectangle. Um, so in a sense, you're, trying to, you're at least on that question, you're picking up you know, how much historically was there enforcement. It's more, more like a line economic mm -hmm. paper. So that's, that's and just along those lines, you might want to be a little careful about like the large MPP. Uh, the large area MPA versus small, because are, are you really trying to minimize like the um, you know the per mile um, mm -hmm. effect, or is it like the overall effect, which might be a function of say how many what, what your police enforcement effort is? It could you know you usually think there are actually economies of scale and mm -hmm. police enforcement, so it was surprising here that there wasn't, but it could be that you're measuring it per mile rather than per say police boat. Or 